I guess we can move on. Somebody might say, okay, you came up with adversarial examples, but they are in the digital world. You show me some digital images, you perturb them, and then yes, my neural network classified it wrong. But in the physical world, we see the world through or our robots or our self-driving cars or our smart cities are going to see the world through cameras. Does your adversarial example survive those sorts of transformations that you see in the, in the real physical world? Let's be a little bit more specific. Let's say you have a machine learning system. This could be a deep neural network, a convolutional neural network. You have some clean example, and you know that your machine learning system is going to classify your clean example correctly to have the correct label. You're going to have an adversarial example, which is perceptually indistinguishable from C, from the clean example, but then it is slightly perturbed. And then that's just a definition of being an adversarial example. Your machine learning system is going to classify it to be something different from the true class. And we saw this observation from the first paper that you can design an adversarial example for a particular model for model one, and they're going to generalize to another model, totally different model with a different architecture, we trained on different data sets. And that's why adversarial examples are serious problems. If, if this was only for one particular architecture trained on that particular data set, then that wouldn't be a big deal. The problem is that they are generalizable. And as I mentioned, our robots are going to perceive the world through cameras and perhaps some other sensors. Our self-driving cars are going to perceive the world through cameras or through uh, LiDAR scanners. Our smart cities and video surveillance systems, like the example that one of you posted on the chat on our GitHub repository the other day, for smart cities, you're going to perceive the world through cameras. Same thing for your mobile application. For instance, you can have your translator, you're in a foreign country, you point your camera at a writing on a building, and that writing on that building, let's say, is in Chinese, and that's going to get translated for you to English. And then you're going to know that that's a restaurant. Okay? So you're going to perceive the world through cameras. Do adversarial examples survive the, tra the transformations that you see in the physical world? Do they remain adversarial examples after a couple of transformations? Maybe, for instance, the topic of this paper is you print the image, which is adversarially perturbed. You take a photo out of it, and then you show it to your neural network. So you do some transformations on your image before showing it to your neural network. Does this image remain an adversarial example? So is the premise clear, what we are trying to do? Okay, perfect. So you have some image from your data set, and then you're going to perturb it and then take an image or take a photo of that image. For instance, this washer, we can just take an image from a printed version of the same image. And let's say that was a clean data, you didn't perturb it at all. And that's going to get classified as a washer with 53% uh, confidence. You perturb it a little bit, take the image, take the photo of the printed image, and then it's going to get classified with a high confidence as a safe. And the second guess is a washer. You perturb it a little bit more, and that's going to get classified as a safe and a loudspeaker with high confidences. So it turns out that these adversarial examples are actually surviving these operations that you print your image and take a photo out of it and then show it to your neural network. And let's say, is this process uh, stable? with respect to different methods of coming up with adversarial examples. And let's do a quick recap of the methods that were available up until 2016 and just compare them. What if you use a different method? What if you don't use gradient sign method? What if you use another type of a method to come up with adversarial example? Does it survive or not? If not, why? You have an image. That image has a true class. That's the Y true. For instance, you have your washer. The true class is a washer. You have your cross entropy loss, which is the negative of the log of the probability of the given class. And then let's just remember this operation. This is just a definition. And that's about clipping 
you want to do a perturbation to your image, you don't want that perturbation to be too big in terms of your L infinity norm. And L infinity norm is looking at the maximum of every single entry in your image, every single pixel. And it could be red, green, blue. You, all, you don't want to go beyond the available number, the maximum number for your red, green, blue channels. So at maximum, if you perturb it a little bit, you don't want to go beyond 255. And at the minimum, you don't want to go below zero because the ranges of acceptable pixel values are from zero to 255. You perturb your image, uh, epsilon to the right and epsilon to the left, and that's clipping. So you want your X prime to be in the interval from minus epsilon to epsilon around the values of your input. So, and that's the idea of clipping. It's a function of your image, epsilon, and the image that you're perturbing or the perturbed image. We covered fast gradient sign method. Let's remember it and look at it from a different perspective. We were motivating this from the perspective of uh, high dimensionality. And because of the high dimensionality of images, even linear models could end up having adversaries or adversarial examples. That was the motivation. And that was where these gradients and signs were coming in. You can have a different motivation. Your loss function for the true class is the negative of the log of your probability of the true class. And if you try to maximize this rather than minimize, you try to maximize this with respect to x and take a step of gradient ascent, you are trying to actually decrease the probability of the true class. So if you try to maximize because of this negative sign, you are minimizing the probability of the true class. And that's why you have a plus sign here, that's gradient ascent. Where is this sign coming from? It is coming from the fact that you want your adversarial example to be epsilon apart from your input image, to have an L infinity norm of epsilon, exactly epsilon. That's why you take a sign. It's as if you're clipping it. So does this make sense? Okay, perfect. You can extend this. Now that you see that as an optimization problem, you can actually do multiple steps of that optimization. You can start with your image. You do a step in the direction of decreasing the probability of the true class. That's what you just did here. But then there is a catch. This might go beyond the range of acceptable numbers for images from zero to 255. And it might end up being beyond epsilon norm. It might end up being a too big of a perturbation. That's why you're gonna clip it. You take the outcome, go back here, take another step in the direction of reducing the probability of the true class. And then you keep repeating that for a couple of iterations. This is a generalization of the fast gradient sign method. And that's gonna give you an adversarial example. That was untargeted. You are just trying to decrease the probability of the true class. Can you make this targeted? If I give you a label, can you actually change the classifier to give us that label? not change the classifier, change the input to the classifier to give us that particular label. We want to make it targeted or actually move it towards the least likely class. This could be any class. This could be the least likely class that the neural network is taking off. Because what does your neural network does? It's gonna take an image. It's gonna give you a probability distribution over all possible classes that could happen. And then you can pick out the label that is the least likely. For instance, in this case, among these two, loudest speaker is the least likely because it has the smaller number. Or if you have multiple classes, you're choosing the least likely one. And you want your neural network to move towards giving you the most or the least likely class as its prediction. What can you do? You can try to maximize the probability of your neural network picking out this class or this label. It means that you're maximizing this probability. Equivalently, you're minimizing this loss function. That's why you're taking steps in the direction of the negative of your loss function evaluated at the least likely. And this Y least likely could be any class that you can choose. And this could be targeted or it could be least likely class method. Just keep maximizing the probability or keep increasing the probability of the least likely class. Let's define a constant 
And because we want to compare fast method, basic iterative methods, and iterative least likely class method together, and we want to met we want to have a metric to compare all of these methods together. Don't worry about the mathematical formula. If you spend some time at home, expand these terms, it's going to become clear. But intuitively, you are counting or you are computing the fraction of adversarial images which are no longer misclassified after the transformation. So this is the fraction of adversarial images that are not going to survive your transformation. And these Cs that you see up there are just a bunch of ones and zeros. After the summations, they are going to give you the count. It's going to give you out of all of the images that are adversarial, how many of them are not going to survive. And this is going to help you find out how many of them are not going to survive because it's going to get zeroed out after this transformation. And the transformation could be printing the image and taking a photo of the result. And these bars are just the binary negations. So intuitively, distraction rate is the fraction of adversarial images that are not going to remain adversarial after your transformations. And n is the total number of images that you're going to use to find this fraction. What's going to happen? Now you are comparing the fast method, the iterative basic method, and the least likely class method. It turns out that as you increase or decrease the magnitude of those perturbations, out of uh, initially out of 100 examples, here around 61 of them are not going to survive after the perturbation. So the smaller the perturbation, they are going to have a higher distraction rate. And then these distraction rates are going to become higher and higher as you use more and more complex methods. So basic iterative is more complex than fast method. Iterative least likely class is more complex than the other one. And why are these numbers bigger? Why are the distraction rates bigger? Because uh, maybe your method for finding the adversarial example is going to end up picking out some fine details in your images and then use them to come up with adversarial examples. And that's why these are going to be more sensitive to these transformations. After the transformations, they are not going to survive because those fine details perhaps don't matter that much. I think I'm going to stop here and answer questions. And for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. I'll be around.